It's time for questions to the Minister of Health, and we will start with the list of questions. And I call uh, Gemma Dolan to ask the first question. Uh, Kesha Ibrahim. Number one. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. I, I recognise that for young children, including children under five, testing may be an unpleasant and uncomfortable experience. Parents may actually find it easier to apply the swab in the home environment using a home testing kit, which can be ordered through the digital portal or by calling the 119 helpline. There is a, vi a video available on the Public Health Agency website to show parents how to actually take the swab. And I am advised that HSC colleagues are looking again at how best to support COVID swab taking on the rare occasions where parents or carers may not be able to obtain a, a sample at a national testing centre. Gemma Dolan, supplementary. I thank the Minister for his, his answer. Um, as you've already alluded to, the process of parents administrating tests to under fives can be difficult and cause anxiety. There's also a deep concern among parents that they aren't doing the test properly. Um, Would the Minister agree that it's important that parents in this, these circumstances are provided with professional advice where necessary assistance to ensure the tests are administrated correctly? And, and the member makes a valid point because uh, an accurate swab is, is critical no matter, no matter who it's on, whether it's a child or whether it's on a, on a pensioner or someone actually in a care home. So the ability to actually take those swabs accurately um, and to ensure their validity is an important thing. And that's why there are people available in the test centres who can provide guidance. They'll not actually take the physical swab, but they will provide guidance and help. And as I said, there is a, a video online uh, that is accessible to guide parents through the process. And I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Obviously, the testing of young children is naturally going to be very challenging, and in particular, if it's a self testing kit. Can I ask the Minister of Health if his department is looking at what assistance uh, could be made available by the GPs um, in the COVID screening of under five year olds through the COVID centres? At this moment in time, it is not an area that ha has been progressed, but um, we are using the national testing site, and as I said, we do guide uh, parents to use the home testing kits where they are available, but definitely advise where, they're guided, where parents are guided to get their child tested. They should. Um, my colleagues in the Public Health Agency um, have advised that testing data shows that, as up until last Thursday, over 10,000 children under the age of 10 have been tested via the, the National Testing Initiative in Northern Ireland, so it shows that avenue is working and is accessible. And that actually includes over 4,500 children under five, uh, and the majority of those have been tested in the past three to four weeks. So the avenue of testing and testing accessibility is, is working for us at this moment in time, but it will take the members' comments away and see if they are of an advantage somewhere. And I call Melissa McHugh. Um, I, I thank the, the member for, for his question. Pillar 2 testing is delivered through the participation in the national testing programme managed by the Department of Health and Social Care in London. I have personally discussed the importance of Pillar 2 testing capacity directly on a number of occasions with my ministerial counterpart in London. Um, my officials are also in daily contact with officials in DHSC to ensure Northern Ireland capacity is optimised through your participation in the national programme. Currently in Northern Ireland, we have four drive-through fixed testing sites and six operational mobile testing units, with two more MTUs due to be operational shortly. The mobile testing units are deployed in towns and villages across Northern Ireland in response to local need. There is also the home test option delivered direct to a person's home via the postal order and the satellite test kit option, which is currently being used to support regular programme of testing in our care homes. Uh, demand for testing has increased significantly across the UK in recent weeks, and I am aware that the national testing programme has currently experienced an exceptionally high demand. But overall, testing capacity is continually reviewed by my department, and there are active discussions underway to further enhance capacity across all aspects of our testing programme, because optimising available testing capacity will continue to be, uh, for me, a key priority and for my officials in the weeks and months ahead. I call Melissa McHugh, supplementary. Uh, uh, just uh, on the testing, that we've seen increased problems and growing public frustration uh, accessing COVID-19 test centres with people being directed, in some cases, to Scotland and even to Wales and so on. 
Does the Minister accept that uh, we need a locally based and accessible testing programme? And, and I thank the member for, 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 for that, that point. And I think when the, I think the, the, mem, uh, the chair of the health committee brought the urgent oral um, last week, I addressed a number of those points. And I think it is the importance of our pillar one and our pillar two. Pillar one is managed by my department. Pillar two, the national programme, which we rely on heavily, um, is supported by supported by access through that national national testing programme, which has actually worked well. Um, for us in Northern Ireland, we have had those difficulties um, in actually accessing. And as I said, I think last week when I was answering that specific question, it was due to the computer-based booking programme, which actually looked at who was booking at closest test site and wasn't taken into consideration. The Irish Sea, or even in my my Welsh counterpart, Von Gethin, was actually having the same problem with with the Bristol Channel. So it was looking for the local closest testing site rather than one that was actually accessible. A lot of those problems have been worked through, a lot of those issues have been worked through, and we're not seeing the same uh, challenge or problems with actually accessing a test. Um, I think it was actually the Times newspaper um, r- ran a poll and they actually tried five postcodes out of um, every local authority, and they tested them once an hour, every hour for 24 hours. Uh, and out of the local districts in, in Northern Ireland, there was only one uh, didn't have the 100 per cent accessibility for testing, and that was Narmagh, Bambridge and Craig Avon, which was shown an 80 per cent rise. What I would say, it was a great poll, and it's something that demonstrated our accessibility to the national testing programme, but I would caution those who want to see and are simply going on to that portal to see where tests are without needing them. Please think of the capacity that's in that system. The caution here, Bradley, supplementary. Um, I would like to ask the Minister if there is extra capacity going into any system, if he would consider the people in Kilkeel and the Mourns who still, despite the errors in the system, maybe the technical errors have been ironed out, are still being requested to travel very unreasonable journeys, given that they may be symptomatic. Um, and certainly, and I, I think, as I said in, in my, my, my answer to the substantive question, that is where we look and where we see the increase. In prevalence of COVID, we actually assign the mobile testing units to make sure we can support the people in the local area if there is an increase in COVID in a specific geographical area. So that's how we target where they access. Um, we have the four te- national testing sites across Northern Ireland to make sure we can get access to the most central locations that we have um, for those fixed sites. But we do use and maximise the mobile testing units where appropriate. Can I call Alan Chambers? Mr. Speaker, uh, I thank the Minister uh, for his response, uh, and it is once, once again worth noting that without access to the United Kingdom's Pillar 2 network, our ability to test the consistently large numbers that we are would be severely restrained. Can the Minister comment on whether he is also considering expanding our own domestic Pillar 1 capacity? And again, I, I thank the Member, and as I said in the substantive answer, that is always the the piece of work that is ongoing, and we do that through, through our partners, partners in Citric um, in the West, through Almac, through the universities, even through AFB in our own Department of Agriculture, where we look to see where the capacity is in lab uh, availability and access, and also to ensure that we can continue to enhance uh, and increase that, that capacity in Pillar 1, because it is vital for us. It's what we use for our, our health service for, for testing programmes. It's also for what the, the pillar that we use for our care homes, uh, where we have identified outbreaks through the, the programme that we have ongoing in our care homes for both residents and staff. Call Gordon Dunn. The Minister for all his efforts in COVID up to date. We do appreciate all the work done. Can the Minister give us some assurance in relation to quality assurance testing uh, in relation to the COVID tests that have been carried out to give the the public real confidence that the tests are effective and accurate, because it is an issue of concern out there with the public, the accuracy of the tests. What quality assurance systems are in place, Mr Minister? Tests themselves have all been accredited through through the appropriate channels before they are actually utilised in any of our testing sites as they are across across the United Kingdom. So even though when there has been calls for the introduction of the new rapid 90-minute or two-hour testing kits, that is why we are waiting to make sure that they are accurate, both in, in terms of, of quality and reproducibility, to make sure that we are reducing the number of false positives 
uh, as possible. We, we do know there are false positives in the system, but I think it's, I would rather err on the side of caution where somebody was working uh, under the assumption of being positive rather than sending somebody who was positive out under the assumption that they were actually negative. Call Colin Gillerney. <coughs> I will thank the Minister for his answers and in relation to the Pillar 2, the Minister has acknowledged that there, there has been difficulties there in relation to booking tests, but is the Minister aware that there are increasing difficulties around the return of results of tests and the time involved there? And indeed that appears to be impacting, it's either impacting children uh, tests more, more heavily or people are more anxious and concerned, but is the Minister aware of that and does he receive information back from the centre on that? Um, and again, I thank the member for his question, and that's some of the conversations that I've had with my, my counterparts across the United Kingdom in regards to the timeliness of the return of a result, because that's crucial. It's also where it feeds into our test, test trace and protect system as well, because the sooner we can identify positive cases, the better it is for those systems to fully interact to make sure we can get on top. Um, of the contacts that have been had by that individual who has tested positive. But it is also that, as the member rightly identifies, that that timely return of a test is crucial for parents who are looking at reassurance um, for their child. I know the member raised uh, a specific with the BBC uh, yesterday. If he wants to pass on the specific details of that to me, I am happy to look into it for him. And I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Question number three. Again, I, I thank the member for, for his question. The Department of Health is targeting the launch of the new version of the app for under-18s before the end of September. It will help schools, further education colleges and universities uh, to provide additional protection to their students and staff. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, most MLAs will have had contact from conster- concerned constituents about young people uh, gathering in groups in the community, not least in areas such as the Holy Lands. What action is the Minister taking, and indeed, what actions are the Executive taking to try and address this issue with young people? Um, in regards to the actions of young people, what I would say, and I've said this before, what we're seeing in the Holy Lands is not reflective of the entirety of young people across Northern Ireland who I think have actually sacrificed quite a bit uh, during the first lockdown of, of Northern Ireland. So I think it's unfair, unfair and unjust to, to target and label everyone um, the same as we are seeing. That's a very small cohort of individuals in the Holy Lands who are actually showing a blatant disregard uh, for not just their own safety but also the safety of their friends, family and of often older relatives um, if they were to co- contact COVID and take it home. Uh, the Executive Office has established a, a working group, cross departmental working group, that is looking at uh, compliance and enforcement uh, in regards to COVID regulations. That has met twice now. It met twice specifically in regards to the work in the Holy Lands. It included the Department for Communities, Executive Office ourselves, the police, Um, both universities, and it's shown, I think, a positive, coordinated response um, for the first first, uh, time I think I've seen for what has been antisocial behaviour in the Holy Lands, but I think COVID has really given that that added added impetus. Um, From what I'm led to believe, in in the last update, there's been 55 COVID notices have been issued by the PSNI. Um, 31 of those were in one house. So that shows the disregard even to the messaging that the universities are putting out. There were also two arrests connected to that same period of time, uh, one for drug abuse and one for assault. So rather than just COVID, breach of COVID regulations, there's also antisocial behaviour that has now been tackled. Uh, and I think that's for the greater benefit of the residents of the Holy Lands. Call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your response so far. Given the spike of COVID-19 cases that we're currently seeing in the border counties of the Republic of Ireland, and this that is leading to a spillover into Northern Ireland, just how valuable do you believe it is that our Northern Ireland app is currently interoperable with the Republic of Ireland version? And again, I, and I thank the member for her question. The app that we launched. Um, a, few, a few weeks ago um, is working well for us in Northern Ireland. Um, we have had quite a number of downloads and, and active, activations. You know, with 362,000 uh, individuals in Northern Ireland ha- have downloaded it, and we're seeing nearly 2,000 notifications. I've went out to people to say they've been 
in contact with someone who has now tested positive. So that does work. It's an advantage of the app. But I think one of the working premises that we had since we started, started to explore the app was to make sure that no matter what we developed in Northern Ireland was able to talk to the same app in the Republic of Ireland, but also uh, not just north-south, but also east-west. And I welcome the fact that Scotland has now produced its app on the same platform with the same, the same setup as our app, so all three should eventually be able, be able to talk. So it does work, it does give us that reassurance that anyone crossing the border when necessary does have, if they have the app, they do talk to each other. Nicole Catherine Kelly. Minister, with pupils back at school, can you outline the steps that are being taken to minimise the spread of COVID-19 in school settings? Um, and, and I thank the member um, for her question. It will be more specifically directed for the Minister of Education. But one of the, one of the things that we have done, uh, especially in regards to school, is the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientific Advisor, we are meeting regularly with Department of Education officials, Education Authority officials to make sure we could give as much um, input into the guidance that was going out to schools as was necessary um, to support those school principals, uh, teachers, all the workers across the school sector, even you know, from, from our very caretakers to canteen workers, to make sure they were getting the advice and guidance that we think uh, they need to support the school ho cohort. Um, what we have done from a Department of Health point of view um, over the last number of weekends, last number of weeks, sorry, has actually established a direct line within the public health agency for school principals who can ring the public health agency should they have a specific inquiry so they can get that answered directly to provide the reassurance for them, their staff and parents. Call Paula Pratchett. Uh, Mr Speaker and um, Health Minister, I just want to come back to the issue of the Holy Lands. Um, you, you mentioned there about the house where there were 35 people came out of one this has been going on since June, so these house parties have been going on for months and months. I'm just wondering, are you going to bring forward some guidance for houses of multiple occupation, given the unique circumstances in terms of how you can have nine people in one house from, from different parts of the country? I uh, thank uh, the member for her question, and I think as she'll point out, it's not only just going on from June, these parties and antisocial behaviour has been going on in the Holy Lands from, from I think the universities and multiple houses or houses of multiple occupancies they have expanded in there. So there is a, a piece of work I think that um, I'm not sure maybe even the Justice Minister is involved in um, in regards through the, the Executive's Enforcement Working Group to see what other avenues or legislation or regulation can be brought forward. With the specifics of houses of multiple occupancy, there does need to be does need to be a care and a caution that any regulation that was brought forward in regards solely uh, based, on, based on houses of multiple occupancy was also equitable across the entirety of Northern Ireland or anybody who was resident in a house of multiple occupancy, should that be not just students in the Holy Lands, but also out of those out of social need or housing, uh, lack of housing in certain areas, that they weren't penalised adversely by any regulation or, or guidance that was brought in specifically to deal with what is antisocial behaviour in the Holy Lands. I call Jerry Carl. Question four. I uh, thank the member for his question. Um, firstly, I want to say that I fully support our health and social care staff, and I again want to put on record my thanks for the magnificent job that they have done during the initial COVID-19 surge and continue to do to provide the best care for the people of Northern Ireland in such challenging and pressurised circumstances. As you will be aware, I, served, I secured fa financial support of £2 million back in March for the provision of free car parking for health and social care staff for a three-month period. That ended on the 30th of June. This was in recognition of the commitment our staff were making to keep the health service going during the initial COVID-19 surge. Although the initial free car, park, uh, car parking period has concluded, I will keep the position under review in the context of the evolving position as regards the prevalence and impact of COVID-19. Under the current policy, which was set in 2012, decisions on how it is applied is for each health and social care trust to determine. Charging is an important mechanism on sites where space is limited, such as the Royal Victoria Hospital, for example, to control demand or to encourage regular turnover of spaces to try to provide su sufficient spaces for patients and visitors. I am aware that the Belfast Trust is currently conducting a review of its car parking charges, and in the context of its review, the Trust has recently agreed with relevant stakeholders 
uh, a set of car parking access criteria for staff which will prioritise the limited parking that is available based on business need and the availability of alternative travel options. The Trust is also seeking to harmonise parking fees across its hospital sites. It is worth noting that it costs £9 million to cover costs of parking, and we currently recover £8 million through income. So even if I was able to find the funding to cover the lost income generated from staff car parking, there is still not sufficient space to provide free car parking for all our staff, particularly at sites such as the Royal Victoria Hospital, where space is limited. To do this would not only create significant accessibility issues for patients and visitors, but it will also require significant capital investment to address these capacity issues, whether this be through the construction of new car parks or putting in place park and ride facilities for staff at locations adjacent to hospitals. Well, Jerry Carl, supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for his reply. Does the Minister agree with me that this latest move to remove car parking, uh, free car parking for healthcare workers, is a further kick in the teeth for people who kept us safe during a health pandemic, and is extra insulting considering the fact that uh, it occurred around the same time that MLA's expenses were increased? Um, I will not comment on, on the last point in regards to, to MLA's expenses. That was not a decision taken by by my department, but what I would like to identify to, to the member is that it's actually only the Belfast and South Eastern Trust that actually charge staff for parking. The Northern, the Southern and the Western Trusts currently do not routinely charge staff for car parking. There are, however, voluntary pay schemes in the Northern and Southern Trusts where some staff have chosen to pay £30 per month for a designated car parking space. So there's not the same uh, application for all across all the trusts. And that's why I wait to see what the outcome of the Belfast Trust consultation with stakeholders and staff actually produces. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. There's a recognition of the sterling work of the staff and his, uh, his constant support to them throughout this pandemic. Um, with regard to the car parking, uh, many of our, our sites are shrinking, as you've rightly pointed out, South Eastern Trust, Lagan Valley, and, and the Royal Hospital in Belfast in particular. Would the Minister agree with me and maybe commit to some work with the executive colleagues and, in particular, Department of Infrastructure with regard to sustainable transport, uh, which would, in fact, uh, improve the uh, environment and improve mental and physical health as well? Again, I thank the member for, for his questions because I think that gets to the crux of the, actually, but the accessibility um, of, of parking and the, and the mode of how people actually go, go to work as well. And I will welcome the commitments and the steps that have already been taken by the Minister of Infrastructure in supporting a wide number of workers across the health and social care system in regards to access uh, to public transport and also that provision. Um, I think it's an example where it has actually shown that during the pandemic and up until now that both our department and the Department of Health and the Department of Infrastructure has worked hand in hand in supporting our staff actually getting to and from work. I call Sean Lynch. Well, yeah, and I want to thank the Minister for his answers. The Minister will be aware that my party colleague is bringing forward uh, from McCann a private member's bill, but does the Minister agree with me that car parking charges for staff is disproportionate for those living in rural areas because of lack of transport? And again, I, I am aware that the member's colleague is bringing forward a, a private member's bill on, on this subject, and that is why I think it is important um, to highlight that it is up to each trust as to how they actually implement um, those staffing charges. And I said in response to Mr Carl, there is a, a, a divergence across all our trusts. But the access to, to public trans transport, especially in our rural areas, is something that we have known for a long time um, needs addressed, and that accessibility is crucial, especially when it comes to staff working at specific shift times as well, um, rather than just and, and including, sorry, including those people who want to visit uh, loved ones in hospital if there is not an accessible public, public transport system. Um, to support them. So uh, I think it's vitally crucial then as well that, as I mentioned uh, in the answer to, to Mr Butler, that we have seen good working between ourselves and infrastructure. It's also important that we see that work continue in developing uh, the public transport system to support our health and care workers, our health and care facilities. So it's also important that the executive give, our, give my colleague in infrastructure the support that she needs in regards to rural transport as well. Nicole Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, question five. I thank the member for, for his question. 
As a con consequence of the need to prioritise the response to the co coronavirus pandemic over the past few months, work on a range of projects, including reshaping stroke care, has been paused. While I believe that this was the right thing to do, I appreciate the wider impact this will have had for stroke patients across Northern Ireland. I can assure you that reshaping uh, stroke care remains a key priority, and I recognise the urgent need for the reform of stroke services in Northern Ireland. Over 19,000 people responded to the consultation on reshaping stroke care, and my officials have completed an analysis of responses. I have asked for some further analysis to be undertaken regarding the staffing requirements for the hyperacute stroke network proposed in the consultation, and this work is currently underway. I intend to consider this analysis alongside the consultation analysis and evidence base for reform in reaching my decision, and I will update the House accordingly. Matthew O'Toole, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, thank the Minister for his answers. Um, understandably, the attention of the Department has been reoriented towards COVID-19 for the last six months, but reshaping stroke care focused on uh, several things, but in particular the, need, the absolute need for early intervention and also the importance of in-community care around rehabilitation. We can be sure that both of those things, unfortunately, have been devastated for that over the last six months, and people will, will be receiving much worse outcomes. Is his department or are the trusts looking at how to make interventions now to compensate, where possible, people who have suffered strokes and have had, unfortunately, very poor care outcomes over the past six months? Um, and again, you know, the, the member makes a vital point, and I think that's um, when he takes into consideration the approach that we've taken to. Uh, re-engaging and rebuilding our services that we've done it in that three-month uh, block to make sure that we're giving the, the patients uh, who need that additional support actually receive it to make sure it's done in a safe manner as well and also supporting our staff the, um, in the provision of those services. So that three-monthly um, interaction and re-engagement of our trusts has been timely in the way we've approached this and it's to make sure that we can provide that, that support to you, especially those people who have suffered stroke, but because that was one of the messages that we continue to put, put out through the worst of the pandemic. Anyone who needed that assistance or thought um, they were having symptoms of a stroke or even cardiac uh, did present to emergency departments and their GPs as well to make sure that they could get on to that care pathway as, as soon as possible. Yeah, um, Minister, transformation is a critical piece of work, and we've had um, consultations on uh, the reassessment of stroke services and also the breast assessment services as well. But can the Minister explain why he hasn't yet um, and refuses to publish the new criteria for transforming services? I will say, say to the member, um, I don't accept your premise that I'm refusing to do it, and I don't think she actually meant it in that, uh, in that form, because I have been and I have received um, support from the, the members' party and also our executive colleagues in the work that we have brought forward. And as the previous health minister came um, from our own uh, party when this works, work started, I think one of the things that Ben Goa um, indicated that for any transformation to happen in our health service, it would actually involve running a transformational health service alongside the current health service, so there would be significant uh, need for input, not just in finance, but also in resourcing the, the shape of, of people actually working in the service. That was going to be challenging pre-COVID. So what we're actually trying to do now within my department and across our health and social care boards is not just run a parallel health service um, where we're trying to get our key services back on track while we support um, COVID services as well. We're actually looking at transformation, although it's coming forward at a slower pace than we would have liked, uh, but it is still going on. So it's not that it has stopped, it's not that I'm refusing, it's just that when we're now trying to run three health services in Northern Ireland, where in January running one was challenging enough. That ends the period for a list of questions, and I now call uh, on Claire Bailey to ask the first question under topical questions. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister, has this um, working group for the Holy Lands actually visited the area at all, or are you planning at any stage to be on the ground um, and see firsthand exactly what the dire state of the area and the multi-systemic problems that need addressed in there are? Um, and I, th I thank the Member because I know it is an issue that she, she has genuinely and seriously campaigned on. Uh, since her time in elected office. It's not just 
because it now is popular to do so. It's some, an issue that she has worked very, very closely on. And, and I haven't been to the Holy Lands uh, myself, but in the working group that is established does have representation from both universities, uh, the PSNI and the local council, who are able to report on a night-to-night -night basis of what they have seen, the interactions that they have actually taken as well. Claire Bailey, supplementary. Thank you. I ask that, Minister, because you have also made mention there that uh, parties in the Holy Lands have been happening for as long as the expansion of HMOs in the area have been happening. And I see that as a very simplistic statement to make. And I really want to stress to the Minister that government and statutory agencies have taken a hands-off approach in the area um, on issues of regeneration for decades. And can we take any hope at all that the establishment of this working group will begin to rectify this long after COVID? Um, and, and I think the member, as I say, I recognise her seriousness in this. If it was solely a health issue, I think we could progress it um, a, lot, a lot more expediently. But it is across departmental, it involves the PSNI, it involves the universities. And I personally think we have seen more engagement in the past number of weeks in addressing what is antisocial behaviour um, in the Holy Lands in regards to COVID and restricting the spread of COVID than we have previously up until now, because I hope and I I sincerely hope, and I mean this um, when I say it to the member, that, that what we look at in addressing this current issue uh, actually addresses the long-term future for those residents who live in the Holy Lands and call it home, rather than just the landlords who, who often have been exploiting uh, the housing base that is actually in there to their own financial advantage. So that's why I look forward to whatever recommendations um, that comes forward from this working group, that if we have to take some of it through as health uh, regulations under the Coronavirus Act, that they're not just for the now, they're actually for long term. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I uh, ask the Minister, with regard to the scenes which we witnessed yesterday in Oma at the Tyrone County uh, GA final and other video clips which have obviously come out overnight and this, this morning of chanting slogans, etc., with no social distancing, not taking away from Dungannon's victory, but there are no winners in the spread of COVID-19. Are the regulations working? Um, I will say, say to the member that I have had numerous um, copies of those videos sent to me, those pictures sent to me. Um, they are of a disappointment, because one of the things we were able to, to do very early on in this pandemic was engage with the three sporting codes. And the three sporting codes come up with, a, with sets of individual guidances and rules and regulations that their own sports and their own disciplinary procedures could take forward um, on sight of what we've actually seen and what was actually produced widely across social media. Uh, I don't think that in any way is in keeping with what those sporting codes and those bodies would expect of, of some of their players and definitely not of their supporters. This virus does not respect any sporting definition, any game, uh, any team. So when I saw that sort of large scale antisocial behavior, well, no, sorry, not antisocial behaviour, but breaches of social distancing regulations, um, it does concern me and I think the member is right. There's no winners when we so see that sort of uh, that sort of outpouring on social media and across media. Keith we can oh, sorry. For, for your answer so far, uh, considering the work you're doing which is sterling work, I may add, on the executive to try and control this pandemic. Has thrown GA apologised to you or the executive? Um, not as far as I'm aware at this point in time. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the minister uh, for an update on the restrictions in place on birth partners attending antenatal hospital appointments and spending time with mother and baby during and after birth? Um, I think the, the member for, for his question, as I'm sure he's aware, it is a, it is a very emotive time and a very um, special time for parents. Um, but what I would say to him is um, there are also the challenges uh, that present for anyone accessing um, hospitals, should it be as a visitor or a patient, that we are taking into to consideration. The chief nursing officer um, will be in contact with all trust directors. Um, this afternoon to look at the enforcements and guidance that we currently have um, for hospital visiting across the entirety um, of our system, because what we have seen in regards to the introduction of the, of the specific postal code 
um, approach that we have looked at over the past few days is a differential across our hospital system. Um, it won't be ideal. Um, it's not ideal, but what we're trying to do is protect uh, the Muller to the full extent of our health care system that it can, and to protect the staff as well. Chris Little, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer. And this Assembly appreciates the need to control uh, transmission, particularly in our hospitals. Um, but does the Minister accept these restrictions are causing significant distress? And will he consider relaxing restrictions to allow uh, partners to attend antenatal appointments and scans to be present throughout labour and to remain with mo mother and baby for longer than one hour post birth? The member has come up. There is a very specific list of, of asks there. Um, as I said, I have asked the Chief Nursing Officer, she is engaging with all trust, to see what um, guidance uh, we can provide to make sure there is a consistency. Um, because where we do see that differential, it does cause stress and an undue uh, challenge um, to not just the mothers, but the birthing partners as well. Um, it is not an easy time for access to our hospitals. So I am not going to give any commitment. Uh, to relaxation um, that may change uh, before this week is out, because what I think is, is of critical importance that we look after the physical well-being of the mother and baby, but I am also acutely aware of the mental support uh, that comes from the presence of a birthing partner. So it's not that we, it's not that this is an easy blanket. No, it's something that we're doing and want to do proportionally to make sure that those supports are there, both um, both physically and mentally. And I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. But I would like to ask you, Minister, to outline what steps um, he is taking to assist the South Eastern and Northern Ireland ambulance, tr ambulance trusts to stop ambulances having to queue sometimes for hours on end outside the Ulster Hospital's emergency department prior to be able to release a patient for triage. We are seeing um, increasingly challenges uh, for our, our ambulance service, um, and especially in, in recent um, weeks and days where we have seen a, a number of cases, uh, COVID cases within our ambulance service, so we're seeing a decrease in the number of available staff. Uh, when it comes to waiting time specifically at Ulster, it is a challenge um, that we are addressing. It is a challenge um, that the South Eastern Trust is acutely aware of, but due to social distancing and the lack of space within the facility, uh, it becomes even more challenging to, to sort out the flow of patients there. But one of the things that I'm acutely aware of, and so is the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, is that every hour that an ambulance sits outside a hospital waiting to discharge someone um, is an hour lost where it could be actually on the road. So they're actually introducing the, the, HAL, or the HALO system where we have coordination from the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service in each accident emergency department. Nicole Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just in follow-up to that, um, I'll not ask about um, the, what's happening with the Ulster Hospital with, with maternity because miscarriages are also happening without partners. But just to ask him, is it time then, given the pressure that's on our accident and emergencies, for GPs to return to having face-to-face um, -face appointments with people and therefore preventing the number of people turning up at ANEs that should be going to their GPs? And again, I thank the member for her supplementary. She, she may be aware um, that again was, was the subject of an urgent oral uh, last week as well. So we're working with the Royal College of General Practitioners, uh, the British Medical Association Committee of General Practitioners, to ensure that they are seeing everyone who needs seen. Uh, and I think one of the things that we do want to dispel is that assumption that GPs are deliberately restricting face-to-face -face, um, access. They're doing a lot of work, and I think it was at last week we were able to say you know, they were up to 8,000 uh, face-to-face appointments. So that number continues to increase, but again, we want to do it making sure that our patients are also entering a safe environment and to work, support the staff who are working in our GP practices as well. So anyone who needs a face-to-face -face consultation, I'm assured, should have access to it, and that's something I'm continue to take up. If the member has individual clients, or sorry, individual constituents that she wants to address to me, I'm happy to take forward with the, the Royal College. Nicole Roy begs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The previous member highlighted the pressures on A and E, and indeed within our hospitals, but equally there is pressure on our GP services. Within the Shetland constituency, the GPs, many of them operate in aged health trust facilities, some of it dating back to the 1960s, which makes caring for patients more difficult and difficult in maintaining social distances. So, will the, will the minister? 
accept my invitation to visit those facilities and see for himself uh, as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, and I, I thank the member for uh, working into topical questions, what he actually had in, in written um, questions earlier in orals as well. So I, no, I, I'm grateful for the member has continued uh, to champion the healthcare system in his constituency in East Andrum, and I'll happily take up that, that invite, and I think is, is quite uh, clear when the member says that, when it is safe, safe to do so. But Roy Beggs. Thanks for that uh, response, Minister. But there has been limited uh, investment, particularly in primary health care facilities within my constituency. I would ask that you would review to ensure that there is a quality of treatment for patients throughout Northern Ireland. And again, um, you know, I am grateful for the dedication of the health and social care professionals across Northern Ireland um, who have been working tirelessly to deliver services at this challenging time. And East Antrim practices reconfigured quickly to protect patients and staff and embrace new ways of working, such as the virtual consultations. Um, member practices across the East Antrim Federation have recently developed plans to individually deliver flu vaccination within their own premises or uh, actually in clusters. And there has been an integrated approach to this work. For example, in Larne, um, all five practices will provide flu vaccination locally in the town. And this has been in conjunction with the local council who have provided premises. So there is that ongoing work, and I'm aware of, of the need in East Antrim. And again, I'm happy if I can't visit the member's constituents, I'm happy to meet him to, to discuss the subject. And obviously, as Christopher Stafford is not in his place, move on to Karen Mullen. Minister, there was a great, considerable disappointment in Derry after last week's adjournment debate. Um, when he had failed to commit to maintain services at the Dairy Community Crisis uh, Centre. Will you, undertake, will you take the opportunity to give an insur assurance that Dairy will not lose access to the crisis services? Um, and I thank the member for, for her answer. She will be aware I have agreed to provide that additional 60,000 in addition to a previous 32,000 to enable that service to continue until the end of March. A separate funding arrangement is being explored for the servants thereafter by both the Council and Extern, and I think I, I, I committed to supporting that piece of work last week in the adjournment debate. And a review into mental health crisis services is commencing and um, will be completed by March 2021. So um, my commitment is not, on, I don't think, in question in regards to, to the crisis intervention service in London Derry, it has been there in the second tranche of money that I provided us to allow them, in conjunction with the Council, to bring forward a funding proposal that I am led to believe um, is well developed and should be well received by the, the body that they are going to for that funding, and it should provide uh, a more longer term uh, financial support than simply what we are doing through the Department currently. Karen Mullen, supplementary. Minister, thank you for, for your answers. Um, and it's just really, uh, I know there's, that's been worked up, but we, we need to ensure that there's no gaps in provision going forward. So it's just uh, that we would have the commitment for yourself to ensure that um, the, the, those services continue and um, we don't allow gaps to, to, to be provided across the trust areas. Thank you. First point is well made, and that's specifically why we signed off on that additional 60000 to provide uh, the surety of that gap between the last monies that we provided and the access and hopefully uh, the starting of a future funding stream. So we provided the 60000 to allow that work to continue, but also so the support of the vital work that the Dairy, London Dairy Crisis Intervention Service actually provides uh, at this present time. And members, the time is up, and I uh, could ask members to take a raise for a couple of minutes to allow the Minister and members to commend the Chamber for the next item. Thank you.